This topic is important from several points of views. Obviously, when we talk about entrepreneurship and innovation, it is a topic that is especially important for the youth, but also there's a question how to make it inclusive for everyone. So we have with us Agata Hidalgo, European Affairs Coordinator at France Digital, the largest startup association in Europe. Nice to meet you, nice to see you here. Nice to meet you and to be here with you today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. I will now hand over to you and to the distinguished speakers that you have on your panel. And I'm very much looking forward to the wrap up session when you will report on the results of the session as this is a session that is really to my heart. Have fun everyone and have a good session. Thank you very much. Looking forward and welcome everyone connecting from home. Uh, this is the second half of the D4D multi stakeholder forum on digital transformation for sustainable development in Africa. And as mentioned, I'm Agatha and I'll be moderating the panel today called Towards a Joint European African Partnership for Digital Entrepreneurship and Innovation. That's a long title to say we want Europeans and Africans to work together to build digital startups in Africa. If that's okay for our technical office, before we start introducing our panelists, I would really like to share with you a video featuring citizens' takes on digital entrepreneurship across Europe and Africa. Can we, can we show the video right now? Bonjour, je m'appelle Martin Labbé et cela fait près de 20 ans que... Good morning, my name is Martin Labbé and uh, I'm accompanying for more than 20 years SMEs and startups uh, and I am convinced that in Senegal, Ghana, Tanzania or Uganda, we are going uh, to play a very important role uh, to support the innovators who are trying to modernize agriculture, health, education and finance throughout the continent. Suriname, South America, and now I reside in Accra, Ghana, West Africa. As a digital nomad, I think it's so important that people know about entrepreneurship, innovation, especially in the Web 3.0 um, development, but also that women, especially on the continent, learn digital skills so that they can, you know, engage on this global digital market. Buongiorno, I'm Adriano Mauro, a managing director of uh, Prototypy, an SME based in uh, Lagos, Nigeria. We believe that uh, the African digital future must be driven by local talents. Every day we nurture a butterfly in Lagos, uh, which flipping its wings can bring uh, disruptive innovation for Africa. But we need uh, a policy framework to protect uh, intellectual properties. Hello, this is Obita Gerald, a Ugandan currently living in Kampala City, a young person involved with the youth in innovation and entrepreneurship, and I believe to attain a strong eco-innovation system, we need to strengthen digital infrastructures and maximize the spaces it offers so as to attain digital transformation. We've heard it in the video, digital entrepreneurship presents many advantages compared to traditional brick and mortar business models. It can improve business intelligence, facilitate and speed up communications with a large number of customers, increase productivity and efficiency, but also offer more flexible working hours and arrangements. It can also lead to the design of new technologies and methods, thus diversifying economies and making them more resilient to shocks like wars and the COVID pandemic. Despite these opportunities, several challenges remain for digital entrepreneurship, and many of them are common to both African and European countries. These include insufficient digital and physical infrastructure, inadequate supporting policies and business environments, shortage of digital and entrepreneurial skills, and many more. Together, the EU and the African Union can foster digital entrepreneurship ecosystems and develop a shared intercontinental approach, for example, with the establishment of digital innovation hubs. To address this exciting challenge, we have invited to this round table some top-notch experts in this field. Let me introduce you to our great panelists today. Hafsa Jamare, founder and CEO of Koamana, a social enterprise developing digital solutions for businesses in rural Af Nigeria. Tom Festerling, CFO and managing partner at Green Tech Capital Partners, a German VC fund that invests in African startups and SMEs. 
Next in line is Josephine Melissa, Africa Policy Coordinator at Kiktanet, an ICT policy think tank doing research, capacity building, and advocacy in Kenya. Then we have Moataz Helmi, Chairman of AfriLabs, a network of over 300 innovation hubs advising tech businesses across 51 African countries. Also welcome to Severin Peters Destract, International Cooperation Manager at Expertise France, the operational branch of the French Development Agency. And last but not least, Charles Murito, Sub-Sahara Africa Government Affairs Director at Google. I guess your company doesn't need an introduction. Welcome all of you and thank you for being with us today. Before we start, a quick message for participants. Please do not hesitate to introduce yourselves in the chat, say what country you're connecting from, and post any questions you might come up with during the discussion. We'll answer them at the end of the panel. So now, without much further ado, let us start with the first round of questions. Hafsa, I would like to start with you. Um, you have founded a company that addresses market gaps for entrepreneurs in low connectivity and low literacy areas in Nigeria. In your opinion, how and why should governments and the private sector collaborate to ensure digital connectivity in Africa? Thank you very much, Agatha. So um, I'll, I'm just going to give a bit of a context on what we do. We run a digital platform that connects farmers and small businesses to markets. And oftentimes we find that we go in, we train them and we leave. And there's no exposure to anything digital. And we always assume we're going to train once and walk away and people learn. But what we're finding is that uh, more and more, you need a lot of exposure to a digital infrastructure like the internet to be able to get accustomed to using digital. So uh, we end up spending a lot on different interventions, but the bottom line is like there's no connectivity. Uh, you find that half the time, the people you work with have turned off their data because data is so expensive, meaning we can't effectively reach them or work with them. And uh, so it's just, uh, I think, important for private sector and government to actually consider the cost of all the other inf interventions they're doing in comparison to what it actually means to just have maybe free data, maybe uh, access to internet for everyone. It may end up being kind of the ideal solution that moves the, the needle a lot. Um, so I, I think it's important for me, I would like to say that private sector and government compares the costs that they're spending now versus the benefits of having just this free infrastructure. Thank you. Over to Tom now. How are you as a European investor leveraging digital technology to work together with local African entrepreneurship system? Thank you, Agatha. Maybe also to give a little bit of context, yes, um, Greentech is a European company, um, but we have been investing in African startups and SMEs for more than seven years. Also, my co-founder co is African, and we have also local stuff on the ground, which I think is very important. But still, um, actually, in the, in the last seven years, we have realized, of course, everyone uses digital technology, but for example, we have also been working with a lot of uh, AfriLabs members, especially for Pipeline, etc. And what we realized is um, that um, definitely to share Pipeline, it's still a very manual process, even though there is a lot of digitalization, everyone has different standards, there's no one tool which everyone can use. So um, what we have learned in the last seven years, what we think it makes a lot of sense is to try to um, align a little bit the data and make it easier to share with each other in the ecosystem. And that's why um, we have also taken the input of a lot of um, um, yeah, other participants in the ecosystem like incubators, like accelerators, like other investors and try to see how can we collaborate better. And um, we now actually last year started a project which has now become a product. It's, it's called Exum Africa. I would invite everyone just to have a look at it because it's quite um, interesting because you can share deals with each other, you can work together and actually do co-investments and leverage, so leveraging digital um, technology. Uh, some AfriLabs members are also already working with us, so this is definitely something where we're using digital technology to leverage and really um, make it more efficient to invest together. 
We'll hear from AfroLab in a minute, but before that, Josephine, over to you. I would like to go back to the topic of, of connectivity that was addressed by Hafsa earlier on. And um, for you, as the go-to expert on ICT policy in Africa, what are, in your vision, the latest regulatory developments in digital connectivity in Africa, and how they, are they expected to impact businesses? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'll just begin by uh, stating that the COVID-19 pandemic exposed uh, and it also amplified uh, the digital inequalities that existed between the connected and, uh, and unconnected. And what I've seen in Africa is that we have seen um, growth in terms of the fast mile connectivity, uh, which is undersea cables connecting the African continent. Uh, we've also seen quite huge investments going into the middle mile, uh, where there's investments both from the private sector and government uh, investing in the national fiber optic infrastructure. However, the challenge lies uh, in last mile connectivity and half attached to, uh, to this, uh, including issues such as the, um, the lack of uh, digital infrastructure. There are also issues around capacity, uh, local capacities and adoption. And what you've seen is that traditionally policy and regulation has lagged behind um, technological innovations, but it was con commendable to see that during the pandemic, uh, quite a number of uh, regulators uh, put measures to ensure that uh, they are connecting the unconnected. Uh, and I'll just like to mention some of these efforts. Um, for example, in Kenya, uh, the Communications Authority published a draft licensing and shared spectrum framework in May. And this resulted to a license uh, for community networks um, that was published towards the end of the year. Additionally, last year, we saw the publication of the dynamic spectrum um, access framework for authorizations of the use of the TV white spaces, as well as a procedure for qualification of geo uh, location databases. Uh, also, um, quite good developments in Zimbabwe uh, with the regulator also uh, introducing a new category uh, in its new statutory instrument uh, with, with licenses for the district and community network internet service provider. And lastly, Ethiopia, where we saw the opening up of its market um, to new operators. And this means that um, when we address issues of the last mile, uh, which in most, in most in instances are as a result of, um, of just most of the rural areas or unconnected areas don't make a business case for commercial operators. And that's why opening it up opening up the markets to uh, new operators, as well as strengthening the capacities of, uh, of local communities is very important. Um, and in terms of the impact of this, I think uh, it opens up uh, to, it opens up uh, uh, the youth uh, to more opportunities for entrepreneurship and also just builds the whole society with access to, uh, to more services, access to education uh, and everything that the digital world offers. So there's a lot going on in different countries. This is super positive. Um, turning to AfriLabs, Moataz, another obstacle to the take up of digital entrepreneurship in Africa today is the shortage of skills. In your opinion, how can the private sector, governments and academia collaborate and learn from each other to build digital and entrepreneurial skills in Africa? Thank you. Thank, thanks, Agatha, for having me. Uh, so uh, a little bit of context of AfriLab. So we are a network of uh, 300 innovation hubs, 320 are, we are going to be 350 in a couple of, of weeks. We'll accept more hubs. So uh, so uh, regarding your questions, how we can uh, uh, like help to create this kind of collaboration between private sector, government, and uh, academia. So let, let's agree first that it's um, um, Africa is not just one country, right? So it's totally different from each region to another, right? So the North Africa, the needs are totally different. And this is one of the common mistakes we are always doing in, in, in such kind of projects or program that we are trying to copy paste models from Europe or from the US and try to implement it in, 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 in a continent like Africa, where the informal economy play a very big role in the economy. So, so uh, what we are trying to do in Afri Labs exactly is we are trying to structure this ecosystem. It's very fragmented in 50, we are, we are having hubs in, in 51 countries, right? So we are trying to structure those hubs. We are trying to map 
and having a one strategy for all those hubs. So we created uh, after 10 years, we started in 2011 now, uh, 2022, after 11 years of operation, we, we are setting now a strategy for the next five years, right? And one of the main important lessons learned that it's uh, we as Afri Lab, we have to um, to start work on, on a regional level. Okay, so one of the uh, issues that uh, uh, resources are limited when when it comes to, to to a national level. So that's why we are. Uh, and at the same time, when we when we try to maximize and work on on a, on a continental level, it's too complex, too too hard for us, right? So what we are trying to introduce you is to have this regional project. So we are trying to find like-minded people people in the same region and try to make all those hubs work together on a regional level and have and at the same time we're trying to create this national network in each in each country so uh, uh, we, we we are building this um, uh, each year we are having this meetup between all the 300 hubs across the country we are meeting this year in, in Zambia next October. So the idea is to share best practices, how success stories in Egypt, for example, or wherever, like in Kenya or Nigeria, how it had been, uh, how it's happened uh, uh, in like this type of collaboration, for example, how successful in Egypt and how to copy paste the startup acts that happened, for example, in Nigeria and how to, to inspire the government in Egypt or any other government in Africa and use the same process and the same methodology, uh, but uh, respecting the, the, the local and national context as well. So it's very important that we um, uh, recognize the, the differences that we have inside the, the continent. And at the same time, we have to, to, to be aware that we cannot copy paste like uh, like um, uh, incubators and uh, accelerators from the West and try to, to force it to be implemented in Africa. We have to find what really fits to the African continent, what really to fits to the informal economy, what really fits to the needs in the local context. So that's my, my answer to this question. Definitely. You said it right. Huh? Each region in Africa has different needs. Pulling resources at the early stage is important and taking them to the national level next uh, is the right way to go. Um, but before we explore more from the African perspective, I would like to go back for a second to my home Europe and ask Severin, who also comes from France, about her view. So um, you work in the public sector and the public sector is also focusing a lot of efforts and resources in developing digital and entrepreneurial skills. So can you tell us about any examples of government-led successful programs in Europe or Africa addressing these two issues? <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Agatha. Um, I think you're right. It's a very important issue for the public sector to be able to enhance the, the economic development of its territory. Uh, supporting development of digital and entrepreneurial skills is definitely a, a way and it can be done at a national or local level. And uh, yes, maybe I would like to take an example uh, I know because it's implemented in the region I, I come from. Uh, in, in the Marseille area, the Arbois Mediterranean Environmental Technology Park is specialized in clean tech, such as renewable, renewable energies, green chemistry, and the development of uh, new materials, mobility, sustainable construction, etc. So the, the, the mission of this uh, tech park is to um, animate and support its ecosystem of research laboratories and uh, innovative companies in order to promote the development of new knowledge of products, services that will contribute to reducing ecological footprints on the planet. So the, the technology park provides assistance to the development of companies like legal advice, uh, business promotion, etc. But also partnership, animations, uh, marketing, rental management. And at Expertise France, we try to set up sustainable partnership between European and African or North African territories so they can benefit from each other's experience in bringing out innovation at a local level. 
Uh, and uh, for example, this type of partnership is being uh, set up uh, uh, within a European project we're implementing in the region of uh, Nabal in Tunisia. And uh, we put them in partnership with the region of uh, New Aquitaine, Nouvelle Aquitaine. And uh, so they work together in order to promote this, uh, this local uh, innovation. So I hope it's uh, answer your question, Agatha. It's definitely a 360 offer that you're giving companies and so good that you're already collaborating on both sides of the Mediterranean. Um, but let's go back to Africa uh, and ask Charles. Um, I'd like to go back on the issue of connectivity with you uh, quickly, given that you're working at Google. So I wanted to ask about your take on the role of connectivity in boosting business productivity and digital literacy in Africa. Thank you so much, Agatha. Uh, it's, it's fantastic to be here. Um, I'd just love to set the context from, from a macro perspective. Over the next five years, we're going to see over 300 million Africans accessing the internet for the very first time. And in the same period, we're going to see an internet contribution to GDP of over $180 billion. That is really significant contribution um, by the internet. For instance, when you take uh, Nigeria, Last year, we saw that the internet contribution to the economy actually surpassed the oil and gas. And so when you think about Nigeria, historically you think oil and gas, but now the internet contribution is really significant. Giving a couple of other data points that I would love to touch on is that by 2030, 43% of all Africans are supposed to be in the ranks of um, the middle and upper classes when you think about um, earning power. And that also means that the household income around the same time is expected to reach $2.5 trillion. But it's not all rosy because when you look at connectivity, there's a couple of challenges that we're currently facing across the continent. And so, for instance, only half of the population of the continent is currently online. And by 2050, one out of every four people on the earth. So 25% are going to be African. So we need to find a way whereby we're thinking about the future of work, the opportunity that the digital ecosystem provides. And one last data point that I would love to touch on is the fact that by 2050 as well, more than a third of the global workforce is going to be based in Africa. So when you put all of these things together, you realize that we have to make a concerted effort to ensure that one, we're getting the Africans, Africans online over the next period of time. In essence, I like to say we have 28 years to solve the world's workforce issue. The second piece is that we need to make sure that they are well skilled because if there's no skills, um, that $180 billion contribution to the economies but in the next five years is not going to be realized. The third piece is the element of policy. Um, and I know Josephine mentioned it, but it's really critical that as we're looking at the continent, and I, I am very aware that Africa is not a country. However, we have to take advantage of the African continent of free trade agreement, which in essence has created the largest free trade area since the, world, uh, the, the WTO was formed. So we can really take advantage of that to really look at how do we create businesses that scale. Because the challenge is if every single country goes at this alone and there's a lot of duplication of efforts, none of the companies or very few of the companies will be substantive enough in terms of building scale to make it worthwhile for investors to bring in capital, to make it worthwhile for them to um, reap the benefits of efficiencies across the board, and also to make sure that we're employing people at scale because we do need to create those jobs. However, it's also not all bad. I want to touch on one last report that we launched two weeks ago, and it's the Africa Developer Ecosystem Report. It was a renewal of a 2020 report that we released with the IFC, and we replicated that in 2021. And we saw that the number of developers across Africa has grown by 3.8%, up to about 720,000 
certified developers on the continent. But what's really amazing about that number is that 38% of all of those developers are doing work outside Africa. So we're already well on our way to creating opportunities for Africans to actually serve the world. And that is one of the areas that I see being a critical component. So if we leverage um, the, the, the different policies across the continent to make sure that we're removing all the bottlenecks, then Africa and Africans will be a great resource for the rest of the world. Thank you, Agatha. There is definitely a lot of potential and we need to act quickly to put it into action. Um, it's definitely a continental challenge that we're facing here, but you mentioned earlier the example of Nigeria, and that allows me to start a second round of questions and go back to Nigeria to Hafsa. Um, so, so far we've discussed connectivity, we've talked about skills, but another big challenge for digital entrepreneurs in Africa today is funding. So in your experience, what are the biggest challenges for young African founders, especially women in, accesses, in accessing finance? So uh, I would say that the biggest challenge always boils down to whether or not the funders can see the value in the company and whether or not the company themselves can either sell their value or have the capacity to actually produce some kind of value to show. Um, so as far as this, how this impacts women, uh, in my experience, you can't really tell whether there's a bias while you're in like your micro form and going around trying to raise uh, funding. But um, what, what is necessary is to know that there's people out there engaging the funders in dialogue and getting them to kind of check their own biases and understand whether or not they're making decisions in the right way. Uh, similarly, on the side of the women, also um, encouraging us to be more confident, um, also um, kind of finding ways to enable us to sell that value. Um, I would say I, there's a company that I work with that kind of helps us understand how best to sell our value. And a lot of the people there are now becoming more and more women of color and it's run by two white males that kind of are overconfident and they're like ecstatic that they found these bunch of women with value uh, but they don't really know how to sell it so uh, the more and more you're seeing indicators of of kind of people not seeing the value uh, of uh, women-led businesses and women not selling the value um, even with my group of uh, female founders that i tend to engage with um, so that's issue number one, but then how do you solve that problem? Uh, of course, I mentioned dialogue, but there's also signaling. Signaling is very important. Um, I find that the biggest traction that I've had as a startup founder, and I've seen other people have, is when someone buys into you, uh, other people buy into you too. Uh, so I'm a... I'm a part of the uh, Smart Development Funds, the EU Smart Development Fund, the AA. And the moment I like, uh, we got that buy-in, it was very easy for other people to begin to approach us and ask about us and kind of want to know what we're doing or even invest in us. And that uh, first stage of scrutiny that you generally face sometimes even as a woman founder, and you often don't know if it's a bias or not, is kind of fallen away. Uh, so I think it's important to get those first set of risk takers that are willing to just uh, put that funds into the women and kind of help that signal. Similarly, it's also important to kind of have the women be out there, like thrust them into positions of discomfort. Like uh, I think I always joke about like how we have to contend with the confident Lagos boys. And uh, sometimes it's unfortunate, you don't want to talk about these, these kind of gender differences, but then they tend to emerge in the statistics. And um, like so more and more like we're, we're uh, I and a group of other female founders are actually actively seeking ways to sell ourselves more like um, sell the vision and focus on the vision and um, one thing that I would say talking about vision is that I've, I've also noticed that uh, with African startups in particular you have to kind of have a lot more traction to be able to raise investment. So you can't just sell an idea. You have to have gone there, found, like you need to always find a way to bootstrap and get to the point where there's some early signs of revenue. And I, I find that that doesn't really apply with, with in, 
with like international startups. So also um, kind of getting these funders to take a risk on our ideas and kind of our vision and believe in us as founders, um, particularly women. So um, yeah, I, I guess there's some VCs here. If you're listening, uh, maybe you can take some hints. <laughs> Thank you. Definitely, the, the next line is indeed an investor who maybe can, can tell us more on all that. But just let me tell you that you here today are providing a great role model for a lot of women, white, of color, of anywhere in the world out there. So I think it's very inspiring. But it's also very interesting from a very strictly financial point of view that you, saw, that you say that bootstrapping first is kind of a must today in Africa. So I would like to hear from Tom, who has seven years experience investing in the African market. Um, what else could be done by the EU and the African Union today to encourage international investors to go to Africa to make it to make the playground like uh, leveled up with the rest of international startups out there? Thank you. And actually, Hafsa, um, also very, very good input. I would be very happy also to connect with you directly afterwards. Um, maybe let's start with some good news. So if you look at the VC market in the last seven years, actually, when we started, the, the total investment in early stage companies, um, and I'm talking about equity investment, it was still below 1 billion, far below 1 billion. And this year, or last year, we are surpassed, definitely surpassed 4 billion. Maybe we even reached 5 billion, depending on which source you're actually looking at. So I think it's a great success and it's something to celebrate, but it's definitely not the time to relax or go slower. It's quite the opposite because you have to see, actually also was what Hamza said, um, it's, it's still very much uh, skewed in terms of region, sector, a lot of support for male founders, for female founders is really, really difficult still. And also actually a lot of the big tickets go to non-African founders. And I think we have to support African founders. And therefore, um, yes, it goes in the di right direction, but um, at the same time, there is still a lot to do. And now um, I think we have not to heal the symptoms, but we have to really look at the roots of it. And, um, and ask ourselves, um, why, is, um, why is this the case? And of course, there's not just one trick to easily to do that. But um, for example, I think there are two things. Still, even though the amounts um, increased a lot, there's still a huge funding gap. So the first of things is still, we need more money coming into the ecosystem. And how to do that? Um, I think there are really good African investors already at the stage. But if we want to get more European, more um, US investors also joining, um, a lot of them don't invest because it's still too transparent for them. To go alone, it's very difficult. Um, it's, it's very difficult to verify data, et cetera. So what we think is um, that we should build um, actually partnerships between um, European and African investors so that European investors, for example, can join um, investment round, which is already 80% filled, to give them the first feeling, um, hey, you already go hand in hand with an African investor who actually already invested in 10 companies, some of them maybe even exited. So um, this makes it, I think, much more comfortable um, to, to have the first taste of Africa for investors who did not do that yet. We are doing this now actually on a small scale for private investors in, in Germany and Europe as Green Tech. We are launching a co-investment club, but I think the EU and the, the African Union can actually do this on a bigger scale or um, join forces with some of us also here in the room to create this on a bigger scale to, to try to, to connect actually um, large institutional investors also with already active investors. And on the other hand, on the second one, I really think, um, of course, um, the, the different development agencies, development organizations, they're already investing in Africa, but a lot of the money goes actually into markets, like I mentioned at the beginning, which are already going quite fast and quite well, which I can understand. And they should maybe continue doing that, but they should put the same amount in regions where the money is not flowing that fast yet. They should put the same amount in first-time funders, not in the VCs who's already launch, um, launching the third or the fourth fund. And um, definitely also support um, maybe even female funders who launch a fund to support female founders. So I think there should be much more going in there and there should be some benefit for, um, for organizations and people who are actually going in these areas which are underserved yet. 
there's a lot of potential to do great work in there. I think it's great that you're pioneering co-investment and I hope someone from the European Investment Fund is connecting to, to scale that up uh, with the guidance of the public sector as well. Um, and indeed, linking up to the issue of female founders, um, I would like to ask Josephine now, um, at Kiktanek, you are also working a lot on capacity building. So when it comes to women's access to finance, do you have any examples of effective initiatives that are improving women's skill in selling their value, um, raising funds for their company, and simply being included in the ecosystem. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Agatha. And I'll just like to build on to what Asta said um, in terms of the, um, there's no sustainable development without financial inclusion, and there's no um, financial inclusion without um, ensuring that all women have access to finances. And so I think from our side, it's worrying that um, when we see stats from our World Bank stating that 70% of African women are excluded from financial institutions, uh, they are unable to borrow, they don't have um, access to uh, insurance services uh, or, or just like having a basic bank. And so for me, I think in terms of interventions and examples that I'm seeing working very well is approaches that uh, look at uh, gender lens investing so that they are able to meet uh, the financing needs of women. 40% uh, of businesses in sub-Saharan Africa are actually owned by women, uh, but less than 10% of them are able to raise funding. Uh, so we've seen uh, some institutions, for example, in Kenya, uh, we have the Kenya Women Microfinance Bank, uh, which just looks at, um, at the specific or ways that uh, women save money or women borrow money uh, because most in most instances um, you know like the, the small scale or medium scale um, enter, uh, women entrepreneurs uh, actually might not see the need of opening a bank account so they usually save in uh, in small groups uh, in Kenya those are called charmers so we are seeing um, uh, quite a number of uh, financial institutions, not the traditional ones per se, but coming up from a cooperative model style that are uh, lending specifically to women groups, uh, because that is how, um, and then they're able to guarantee each other. Uh, because in also to note that in most instances, especially in Africa, uh, women might not have access to collateral such as uh, title deeds. Uh, another intervention that I see working really well is um, leveraging on digital platforms for financial institutions, uh, sorry, for, for women consumers, uh, because through these digital platforms, you're able to build capacity. Uh, in fact, yesterday I was having a conversation with um, uh, one of the of, of uh, one of the women in Kenya who is running um, a program uh, that teaches women a digital platform that teaches women on on business uh, and entrepreneurship, um, and so such platforms uh, and to add to uh, the value that other existing platforms such as the mobile wallet. Uh, with M-Pesa are, are bringing, it means that uh, women uh, consumers are able to save but are also able to get information and knowledge as to how uh, they can build um, their businesses. And lastly, is just um, something uh, quite interesting that we've seen uh, with them, Copa Solar and Paygo, who are offering uh, pay-as-you-go solutions, which are quite interesting because they combine uh, micropayments as well as technology. So I think uh, to the issue around uh, women financial inclusion, it's very important that uh, we create tailored solutions that fit women, uh, understand how women save their money, understand how women invest, understand how women, um, you know, it say that majority of the revenue that women generate is actually reinvested back uh, uh, for social economic growth, especially for their families. So I would say that it's critical that uh, we create women-centered uh, solutions. Definitely. And uh, I, I think it's super interesting, the point that you made, that it's important to that adapt financial instruments to local context and also to use digital as a way to transmit skills and knowledge. Um, but I would like now to follow up on something that Tom mentioned earlier, which is the importance of partnerships to bring in investment uh, to Africa. So I would like to ask Moadas, um, what is in your view the potential of digital innovation hubs linking the EU and the African Union in improving financing and growth opportunities for African founders? 
sorry, thank, thanks for the question. Uh, I, I want to second uh, Tom on, on uh, when he talked that we, we uh, last year in 2021, the African ecosystem startup, they received around 5 billion uh, USD in funding, in, in equity investment. Uh, but, but the issue of these 5 billion it, it, that it goes uh, and it's very concentrated in, in just four countries in, uh, in like 90% of this 5 billion went to Nigeria, Egypt, South Africa and Kenya. So the problem here is not like we still have like another 50 countries in Africa that don't receive enough money to support the investment and the, like the, 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 the idea phase of those startups. So uh, what we what we tried to do in Afri Labs, we created a program like a match fund with uh, IBAN, which is Africa Business Engine Network. So it's funded by the uh, Digital Africa Initiative by President Macron. It's 1.5 uh, million euros that uh, is going to uh, support um, this type of, 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 of funding. So we are, uh, we are having a maximum ticket uh, 60,000 euro per, per startup for a startup that are located in AfriLabs network and from investors that are from the IBAN network. So the idea is to structure and to map the, the funding that happened in Africa, this is number one, the second one is to help angel investors to structure themselves. So currently we see like, for example, a case of Sudan, like they are starting now to create their angel investor uh, network. So we started like this, not stereotype countries. We started to see uh, more countries started to build this angel investor, started to organize themselves, which is very important to be, uh, to have a healthy ecosystem and like, like a component of angel investor, a component of hubs, and a component of startup. And the three are collaborating together to identify the opportunity and to, 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 to really highlight these opportunities for, for, for early stage investors. So the Catalytic Africa Fund is one of those uh, projects that we are currently working in its two years uh, program and uh, and it's uh, we already uh, succeeded in four uh, investment we did already four investment as a as a pilot phase and we are trying to expand and the idea here that we 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 um, we keep two investment by uh, per country so we want to make sure that other countries in the ecosystem have equal chances like the same uh, and opportunities as the, the four uh, the big four countries like uh, Nigeria and Egypt. so we are done with, with, with investment in Nigeria and Egypt, South Africa and Kenya. We are open now to other countries, to other investors to come on board and look, tell them, look, we are supporting this kind of new angel investment uh, movement and wave. And we are having this matching fund. It's supported by the French government. We are here. We are having the, the platform. We are having the opportunity and we just need your uh, intervention as an angel investor. So the ratio of our of, of this match fund is two to uh, two, um, two to one. So any investor who put a uh, maximum ten thousand dollar, he uh, we match this fund uh, twice. So it's uh, the startup receive uh, twenty thousand dollar. And if the investor, the angel investor, put more than ten thousand uh, dollar, we triple this investment. Uh, uh, to help the, uh, like to help the startup and to help uh, as well the hub, so the hub takes like ten percent of this investment as well. So this kind of new mechanism that we are bringing to the ecosystem can help uh, to have uh, to, can help to support the current situation and help also to bring on board new angel investors to the equation. So building local angel investor communities is essential. Um, I'd like to remind everyone connecting in the chat to not hesitate to post their questions because we'll be collecting them and asking them in a, in a few minutes. Uh, but before doing that, um, Moetaz, you mentioned the French government, so I can't but go back to France and ask Severine on a broader level, um, what do you think is the added value of bringing African and European digital innovation ecosystems closer together? And what is, in your opinion, the best way to do it concretely? Thank you, Agatha. And uh, I would say that it's, uh, it's exactly the objective of the African European Digital Innovation Bridge flagship projects that uh, we are part of. And uh, this project has, um, 
as a deliverable of the last uh, EU AU summit, the Team Europe Initiative IADIB aims to support partner countries in strengthening their digital and innovation ecosystem and pro promote intercontinental cooperation between stakeholders in Africa and Europe. And at the end, the ultimate vision is to establish a single market for digital innovation between uh, both, uh, both continents. The, the first pilot, IDIBnet, creates a pan-African network of uh, African digital innovation hubs, which will strengthen companies in their digital transformation path and uh, create economic growth and employment opportunities on the African continent. These hubs provide uh, access to the latest uh, knowledge, expertise and uh, technology in order to support companies with piloting, testing and uh, experimenting, experimenting uh, with digital innovations. By bridging hubs and uh, stakeholders uh, from the innovation ecosystem, in Europe and Africa, they establish direct and uh, concrete partnership. And um, what is uh, the good news is that um, the call for application for the, those uh, digital innovation hubs was launched last November, and ID Burnett received uh, 70 proposals from 22 African countries. And now 12 consortia have been selected, which qualify to become a digital innovation hubs. And we are really delighted to have received so many highly qualified applications from all over Africa. And uh, they come, uh, the 12 selected consortia not only comes from all five African regions and thus will contribute to establishing a network with which connects innovation ecosystems from all across Africa. They also focus on four different sectors that are key to build a diverse, diversified, inclusive, sustainable and resilient economies, such like uh, climate smart agriculture, digital trade, uh, smart cities and uh, clean tech. So I told you that uh, the, those 12 um, hubs have been selected. I would have been so happy to tell you all about those 12. Unfortunately, I think we don't have time here. Uh, but I would like to highlight a couple of them that you will see it's really passionating. Um, and uh, <coughs> And it illustrates well the value of such partnerships uh, to address major social, uh, societal uh, challenges. So, for example, in uh, smart agriculture, uh, the GEIA hub in Senegal aims to help fishermen and farmers to improve their productivity to ultimately achieve food security by facilitating access to mindful digital solutions using geospatial data. So it's very promising. The Smart City Lab in Rwanda provides a bridge between the private and public sector by connecting government priorities with ideas and solutions from innovators and businesses. It aims to help build capacities of innovators create opportunities and ease access to finance to make cities and communities smarter, climate resilient and future proof. So also very passionate. And uh, the, the third I, I would like to mention is a, a hub called uh, CleanTech 216. I don't know why, but uh, I would uh, try to figure out uh, in Tunisia, and it's a hybrid hub for the development, prototyping and incubation of clean technologies in order to improve climate resilience. It's, it is focusing on innovating in clean tech solutions for the private sector in order to help their digital and green transition. 
So I will stop here for the for the selected apps, but um, you feel free to go uh, on the IDBnet website in order to see all the, the selection of those uh, uh, very promising uh, innovation hubs. We'll definitely be following developments of these very exciting projects, addressing so many important challenges across so many countries. Um, but I need to be aware of time here. So before we move to the Q&A, I would like to quickly ask Charles how Google is helping in strengthening European Africa private sector partnerships. Thank you so much for that question. And it's actually... I think we can't hear you. We lost you temporarily, Charles. Hopefully he'll be able to reconnect very soon. In the meantime, I'd like speakers to start thinking about the first question we've had in the chat, um, which is about how climate change um, plays a role in all these discussions we're having about digital entrepreneurship in Africa. Um, so we'll get back to that as soon. Yeah. Um, Charles, we can't hear you yet. Maybe your mic is off. I'm sorry, Charles, to interrupt, but I think we still can't hear you here. Can you please try to to reconnect? I'm afraid we can't. I thought it was on my side, but apparently it's everyone. Would you would you mind like reconnecting? We'll give you the floor as soon as you have audio again. <laughs> Super sorry about that. It's the issue with distant panels. Um, so so yeah, to go back to the question that we had in the chat on on climate change, maybe. Uh, while Charles fixes his little technical problem. Is there anyone who would like to pick up? Um, I don't know if Severin or Moatas have examples. Oh, Charles, are you back? I am back. Sorry. Uh, there you go. So the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so I was just talking about how um, as part of our Africa um, investment of a billion dollars, we just launched today Equiano in Togo. And this was a partnership between the government of Togo and Google. And this is a great example of private-public partnerships to really focus on the reduction of um, data costs across the continent. Um, because as, um, as you may know, the, the cost of data is a significant challenge when it comes to getting people online. But I also wanted to touch on a couple of other points that were, uh, or build on a couple of points that were touched on um, by Hafsa and um, and, and Tom earlier. Um, the challenge of funding for women is a really per pervasive one and even more so for black founders. And so again, working closely with governments as well as uh, a private companies such as ourselves, last year we launched the Black Founders Fund, which is dedicated to invest in startups that are led or serve black um, populations on the continent. And this is something that uh, we've launched. We got um, 50 companies to, to be recipients of this. And it's important to note that this is equity-free funding that we actually um, invested in. Alongside that, again, for Africa, we did launch the Africa Investment Fund, which is a $50 million fund focused on black uh, or on African founders and startups on the continent. And this is uh, really investing on an equity basis. Um, so really looking at some of the best companies that are growing, that need funding, that we can really invest. And we don't only just invest the capital, but we also help with other um, mentorship, et cetera, um, through programs such as Launchpad Africa, 
which we've seen over 85 companies from Africa go through that program, including some great about, for instance, um, Twigger uh, Foods, Flutterwave, Paystack, um, etc. cetera, um, Pezesha, uh, which is uh, owned um, and founded by a, a black female founder. Um, so we're really looking at it more holistically and saying, how do we as a private company ensure that we're working closely with governments to push on the um, policy side to make sure that the policies are ready so that when companies such as ourselves can really be uh, want to invest, we can have the right um, policy environment to enable that investment to go through. Thank you, Charles. Thanks, Thank you so much. And we only have a very few minutes before the end of the panel. Um, so I'm wondering uh, whether Severino of Moatas maybe, or even Tom, have any take on, on climate change action by, by startups in Africa or, or some projects that are going on there to answer the question in the chat. Severin, maybe, would you like to start? Very quickly, huh? 30 minutes for a sec. Yeah, very, very quickly. Yes, we we try to support uh, to support and to finance the development of uh, entrepreneurship that have an impact on uh, on climate change and uh, especially try to make uh, a structure to change the, the the process the way they 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 they. they they use a, the, their process, and uh, I, I really believe that uh, entrepreneurs and the private sector has a really uh, a role to play on uh, on this uh, this climate change. And we have uh, through our project, we can see a lot of ideas of new. Uh, you, using new technology, uh, including in a circular economy. I have some example, but I would not have time to develop it here, but very interesting that in the same time, a very low tech and using te tech in order to, to face uh, climate change. So um, lots of example in our project and it's very promising also. Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah. To add to that, um, we are also working like next to our investment pillar. We have actually a consulting and advisory pillar, and we're working also, for example, with the German Development Agency in several projects. One of them is the, um, the strategic partnership technology in Africa, and there we identify especially companies in uh, supporting green technologies, helping them actually um, um, to, to support them operationally, but also help them to do fundraising. So there is a lot of this going on, and we actually identify some of them which we also like as investment cases, so maybe there will even be more of that. That's excellent news. Maybe 30 seconds, Moatas, do you have anything on that before we, we wrap up? Yeah, actually, yeah. Before we wrap up, yeah, I think uh, we we've witnessed a lot, a lot of like EU AU projects coming on the ecosystem, like recently, like Hibiscus, which aims to support IoT uh, skills and capacity building for hubs. So it's a two years program funded by the European Commission, two million euros to uh, to create like solution labs uh, and business box and uh, platform to support the IoT industry. We've seen African, we've seen. Uh, DigiLogic, uh, Af uh, Africa European Digital uh, Innovation Bridge. We've seen a lot of initiatives and the program, which is very, we are very lucky to see this movement and waves coming uh, now. That's fantastic and that's, it's a great conclusion. So if I had to summarize the main takeaways of today's session, there's a huge potential in Africa. We are moving in the right direction with startups, investors, projects, but a lot more needs to be done, including women in boosting connectivity, creating skills and building partnerships, but also pulling efforts rather than um, duplicate initiatives. So with that, I would like to conclude. Thank you, Hafsa, Tom, Severin, Muadas, Josephine, Charles, for being as with us today, for sharing your insights. I could keep talking to you and we have so many more questions. Um, so I look forward to keeping in touch with you uh, after this panel and I hope participants will reach out to you and keep following the great work you're doing in your different countries and sectors. Um, keep up with everything you're up to and we'll be following closely. So I think we only have one minute left. So it was like, I would like to thank participants for being here today for their questions. And uh, I'll let you enjoy a short break and the rest of the D4D multi-stakeholder forum this afternoon. Thank you very, very much. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon and hopefully stay in touch. 
Thank you all. Thank you. Back to plenary. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. What a meaningful session that we've just had. And especially since this session was about entrepreneurship, it was something that is very much to my heart. And I assume that also to the heart of many of you in the audience. I can imagine there are many entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs on the two continents. And I hope there were insights for you that you can use. So thanks again to Agatha for moderating us through this panel. And also take the opportunity now that you, all those organizations have been presented to you. I assume and I'm sure that many of them would be happy to also interact with you. So go online, be active, interact with them. You've heard about several initiatives by the different stakeholders, among others, the Black Founders Fund of Google, but also other panelists have their organizations who are there just to support entrepreneurs on the continent and for some of them also on both continents.